the third luminous mystery the proclamation of the kingdom of god and the call to conversion the grace we seek is to be holy by a radical living of the gospel let us dedicate this decade to all the saints who lived radically the path of the gospel Christ have mercy Lord have mercy Christ hear us Christ graciously hear us God the Father of heaven have mercy on us God the Son Redeemer of the world Have mercy on us God the Holy Spirit Have mercy on us Holy Trinity one God Have mercy on us Holy Mary Mother of God, pray for us. Holy Virgin of Virgins, pray for us. Saint Michael, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael. All the holy angels and archangels pray for us. Saint John the Baptist pray for us. Saint Peter pray for us. Saint Paul pray for us. Saint Matthew pray for us Saint Mark pray for us Saint Luke pray for us Saint John pray for us Saint Jude All the holy apostles and holy saints pray for us all the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ pray for us all the holy martyrs and holy saints pray for us Saint Augustine pray for us Saint Francis de Sales pray for us Saint Anthony pray for us All the holy bishops and confessors pray for us Saint Thomas Aquinas pray for us Saint Claire pray for us Saint Francis of Assisi pray for us Saint Don Bosco pray for us Saint Hello 
she has Saint Dominic Savio Saint Maria Goretti Saint Father Pio Saint Faustina Kowalska All the saints of our God Lamb of God Who takes away the sins of the world Spare us, O Lord Lamb of God Who takes away the sins of the world Graciously hear us, O Lord Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Dear friends, in the first luminous mystery we saw Jesus, the beloved Son, being anointed as Christ the Messiah. In the second mystery, the wedding at Cana, Jesus begins his work of restoring all creation to its original innocence. In this mystery, we contemplate the manner in which Jesus plans to renew creation by proclaiming the kingdom of God and calling people to conversion. In fact, in John 17, 17, Jesus would pray, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Let us listen to the Sermon on the Mount. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how shalt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. But what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask him a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts unto them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one who heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Dear friends, today as you pray this decade, I would also invite you to practice Lectio Divina. Listening to Jesus himself preaching and resolving like the saints to follow radically the path of the gospel, the path to holiness. Spend a while today to meditate on your favorite beatitude using the Lexio Divina. Let's take a quick look at Lexio Divina to revise our memories. Hello, I'm Joan, and I want to tell you about my experience of Lexio Divina. I had trouble, like a lot of people, praying and paying attention to the scriptures. The Bible would scare me, really. I couldn't figure out how to get into it. And my prayer life was mostly occasional bursts of words toward God. So I never felt like I was growing in my prayer. But two years ago, when my parish priest introduced me to Lexio Divina, I had a whole other take on things, both on prayer and on the scriptures. This prayer form gave me a new sense of hope and showed me how the Holy Spirit can act in my life. So I invite you to take a few minutes to learn about Lexio Divina, this treasured method of talking with God. Thanks, Joan. I'm Father Eduardo. Lexio Divina, translated from Latin, means divine reading. It's a five-step method of praying with the scriptures. Each step can open up the treasure of God's word and lead to life-giving encounters with Jesus Christ. Lexio Divina is a unique method because it's about reading the Word of God so as to listen deeply to it and experience the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Christians have been using this method of praying with the scriptures since the third century, and today, Pope Francis, in Joy of the Gospel, recommends Lectio Divina as a particular way of listening to God. Pope Benedict XVI elaborated the five steps of Lectio Divina in his message to the church titled, The Word of the Lord. Here's how it works. Step one, read the scripture passage. Step two, meditate on its meaning for you. Step three, pray based on your meditation. Step four, contemplate the loving presence of God. And then step five, with the help of the Holy Spirit, act to find new direction in your life. Joan will help me to teach this method to you. Before she starts, Joan selects some verses from the scriptures. Today she has chosen St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter five, verses 17 to 20. She finds a quiet place to avoid distraction. She places herself in the presence of God and prays for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The first step in Lectio Divina is reading the scriptures, the living and inspired word of God. You can read the passage out loud or silently. 
In this first step, we ask the question, what does the biblical text say in itself? Brothers and sisters, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Joan now moves on to step two, meditating on the scriptures. She reads the scripture passage again, either silently or out loud, and dialogues in her heart with the word of God, pondering questions and seeing new things. She looks for a word, a phrase, or an idea that comes to mind and touches her heart. Once this happens, she asks the question, what does the biblical text say to me? Brothers and sisters, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. The part of the passage that touched my heart is whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. I'm not exactly sure why at this point. I only know that the words whoever is in Christ is a new creation and new things have come just seemed to pop out at me as I meditated on the passage. I have not been praying as much as I would like to lately and I feel bad about that. Joan now enters into the third step, prayer. Aware of God's loving presence, Joan prays asking how the Spirit is prompting her to respond to God through the words that she is meditating on. She asks the question, what do I say to the Lord in response to His word? Depending on her situation, she could thank God and, and praise God ask God for strength or courage or, or pray for someone else. Joan listens to God, speaking to her heart in this passage, and then she talks to the Lord in prayer. The parts of the passage, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. Give me hope. I have been impatient and angry with people lately. When I don't pray, I lose my center and my impatience with others only gets worse, which makes me anxious and unhappy since that's not who I want to be. I want to change. So in prayer, I asked God for help. The fourth step of Lecture Divina is contemplation. Joan now becomes still and focuses on God as revealed in the scriptures and her experience. She rests in God's loving embrace and beholds God's glory and majesty. No words are necessary, only attention to the God who created her and now is transforming her into a new creation in Christ. In my contemplation, I felt a peace in God's presence and an assurance that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide me. I also had a sense of hope, since I know it is God's grace and power that helped me to change. The fifth step of Lectio Divina is action. In the sense of desiring to know and do the will of God, with confidence in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Joan now asks, what is God's will for me? She waits for the Holy Spirit and seeks new direction in her life. Not every experience of Lectio Divina will result in a specific action, but we need to be attentive to the ways in which we can bring about God's kingdom and do God's will. I see that I have to pray more. I will make time for prayer each morning. 
7 a.m. works best for me since I'm a morning person and this is a good time for me in our household. At least it's a start to a better prayer life. I trust that after I meet the Lord each day in prayer, that my relationship with others in my life will improve. I trust that God's promise in this scripture can come true for me. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Anyone can use these five easy steps in praying the scriptures. Each of us will have a different experience with Lectio Divina because we're all at different stages on our spiritual journey. Wherever you are on your journey, have confidence that Lectio Divina is a proven way for you to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. One, read the scripture passage. Two, meditate on its meaning for you. Three, pray based on your meditation. Four, contemplate the loving presence of God. And then five, with the help of the Holy Spirit, act to find a new direction. In his letter, starting afresh with Christ, Pope John Paul II said that holiness is inconceivable without a renewed listening to the Word of God. It is there that the vision of faith matures learning to look at reality and events through the eyes of God to the point of having the mind of Christ. What is holiness? According to Pope Francis, holiness is the radical living of the Beatitudes, the key to unlocking the Christ life within us. Dear friends, Beatitudes that form the heart of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is the path that leads us to the radical renewal in Jesus. Behold, I make all things new. This is the path to the kingdom of heaven, to holiness, to happiness. As we listen to the Pope, let us pray in our hearts, Lord, teach me to take to heart your teachings on the Beatitudes. Iniziamo oggi una serie di catechesi sulle beatitudini nel Vangelo di Matteo. Ma cosa vuol dire la parola beato? Perché ognuna delle otto beatitudini incomincia con la parola beato. Il termine originale non indica uno che ha la pancia piena o se la passa bene ma è una persona che è in una condizione di grazia, che progredisce nella grazia di Dio e che progredisce sulla strada di Dio. La pazienza, la povertà, il servizio degli altri, la consolazione, che progredisce su quella. Questi sono felici, questi saranno beati. E sarebbe bello imparare a memoria per ripetere, per avere proprio nella mente, nel cuore, questa legge che Gesù ci dà. Ecco davvero la santità e il volto più bello della Chiesa. Il volto più bello. È riscoprirsi in comunione con Dio, nella pienezza della sua vita e del suo amore. Si capisce allora che la santità non è una prerogativa soltanto di alcuni. La santità è un dono che viene offerto a tutti, nessuno escluso, per cui costituisce il carattere distintivo di ogni cristiano. Tutto questo ci fa comprendere che per essere santi non bisogna per forza essere vescovi, preti o religiosi, no. Tutti siamo chiamati a diventare santi. Tante volte più o poi siamo tentati di pensare che la santità sia riservata soltanto a coloro che hanno la possibilità 
distaccarsi dalle faccende ordinarie per dedicarsi esclusivamente alla preghiera. Being poor of heart, like Francis of Assisi, that is holiness. Reacting with meekness and humility, like Francis de Sales, that is holiness. Knowing how to mourn with others, like Damien of Molokai, that is holiness. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, like Archbishop Romero, that is holiness. Seeing and acting with mercy, like Vincent de Paul, Faustina, that is holiness. Keeping the heart free of all that tarnishes love, like Dominic Savio, that is holiness. Sowing peace all around us, like Pope Paul VI and John XXIII, that is holiness. Accepting daily the path of the gospel, even though it may cause us problems, like Antony of the Desert, that is holiness. The Pope gives us the greatest criteria, the ninth beatitude. You did it to me. Satiating the thirst of Jesus in the poor, like Mother Teresa. The fruit of prayer is always the deepening of faith. And the fruit of faith is always love. And the fruit of love is action. We must put our love for Jesus in a living action. How do we do that? If we do it with Jesus, if we do it for Jesus, and if we do it to Jesus, then we know that we are with Him. We are going to be judged by what we have been to Him. And He says, I was hungry, you gave me to eat. I was naked and you clothed me. I was homeless and you did it to me. There's no imagination, no maybe. We don't need to believe that. We know it is like that. And Jesus has said, you did it to me. And to be able to do that, we need the Eucharist. We need Jesus in the Holy Communion. We need the bread of life. That's why Jesus made himself bread of life to satisfy our hunger for his love. And then he makes himself the hungry one so that we can satisfy his hunger for our love. And how do we have to do that? Where does it begin, this love? At home. And how does it, this love begin? Family that prays together, stays together. And if you stay together, you will love one another as God loves each one of you. Dear friends, Jesus himself is the perfect portrait of the Beatitudes. St. John Paul II says in Veritatis Splendor, the Beatitudes are a sort of self-portrait, autobiography of Jesus Christ. And for this very reason are invitations to discipleship and communion of life with Christ. Let's pause a moment today to ask, what do the Beatitudes teach me about happiness and holiness? How is Jesus crucified, the perfect example of the Beatitudes? Which is my favorite Beatitude? Who is someone who I know lives well this Beatitude? Let us conclude our reflections on the proclamation of the Kingdom of God and the call to conversion by speaking about the importance of proclamation. There is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom and the mystery of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, are not proclaimed, says Evangelii Nunziandi. The first way we preach is by our very life, as the saints did. Pope Francis says, the real reformers in the church are the saints. Quali sono i più grandi riformatori della storia della Chiesa o delle Chiese, delle nostre Chiese? Io dirò che i più grandi riformatori della Chiesa sono i Santi, cioè gli uomini e le donne che seguono la parola del Signore e la praticano. 
No use going anywhere to preach, says St. Francis of Assisi, if your going itself is not a preaching. Always preach, he says. When necessary, use words. We need to use words. For what to me, says St. Paul, if I do not preach the gospel? 1 Corinthians 9.16 To save souls, one's own souls and the souls of others, proclamation of the kingdom of heaven is essential. That is why when John Paul II came to Delhi on the 6th of November 1999, in the midst of so much of opposition to Christian proclamation and missionary work, John Paul II walks into Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium and there he speaks to the millions of people who were following him. We pray that God will give you the strength to lead us into the third millennium. The church looks to the laymen and women of Asia to reflect the light of Christ wherever the darkness of sin, division and discrimination. Do not be afraid to proclaim the gospel. Do not be afraid to become martyrs. Turning to the priests, he reminded them of their ordination. When they were told, Receive the gospel of Christ whose heralds you have become. Believe what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. And to millions of people following the Pope on TV, on that Diwali day, he said, The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Let us therefore pray with the saints. Lord, give me the grace to radically live the Beatitudes and to spread your fragrance wherever I go.